Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Hi, my name is Nimrod Geva. I'm Head of Development at Quizzical Pictures. I'm moderating this panel on transforming screens. Um, there's been a lot of developments in the industry locally um, and around the continent. We do have these headsets, which I think we gave a briefing on before everyone is here. Um, but if you want to try them out, um, if it gets too noisy, you can give that a bash. Um, oh, there we go. I think we're good now. Thanks so much for joining us for the um, Red Eye session at both Africa, Fame Week, and CTIAF. Um, I'm very happy to be here with Timothy Oquaro, who is Executive Head of Programming of Multi Choice Africa, uh, where he is responsible for implementing the content strategies for both linear and OTT across East, West, and Southern Africa. Timothy, thanks for joining us. Uh, Leila Swart is owner of Yellowbone Entertainment, an uh, independent production company in South Africa. Um, Khalida Jalalaiti is a screenwriter, film director, indie filmmaker, and Louise Corcott Stevens is co founder of, and uh, CEO of Ear Candy, which is a localization and dubbing service in South Africa. So I want to keep this really moving, lots of time for questions um, and interaction. Uh, but maybe just to start off, or to get our brains um, kind of thinking about all the different aspects of the film and TV industry, um, we have got a huge amount of change that's happened in the last few years in South Africa, particularly, uh, but also in other parts of Africa, like Nigeria, where um, the streaming wars have come to Africa. Um, the streaming wars have changed the landscape here. There's been a huge rise in competition and opportunity and content production. Um, and I think both local players and international players have kind of raised the bar um, of what's happening. Now, internationally, we're seeing a huge um, cutback now on spending on production um, between the strike and between um, kind of the you know, the revaluation of what streaming as a business can do. Um, and I guess my first question is, uh, is to Timothy, are we going to see a, a sudden crash locally, um, at least from multi-choices perspective? Do you think um, streaming and content has gone too far in terms of production in Africa and South Africa? Or do we still have some runway uh, before we have to kind of think about those, those horrible questions? Thank you. Um, I, think, I think in Africa, the unique position that we're in now is that uh, internet penetration is not fully, fully, fully done yet, right? So I think on average we have about 70% internet penetration across different countries in Africa. And, and then that means that there's still a huge opportunity for the streamers and, and, and other broadcasters to come in and, and, and play, right? So we still have some runway, quite a lot of runway. Uh, I mean, as much as we're excited uh, about the partnership now with, with, with the, with the um, company as Comcast, and, and, and that gives us the opportunity to scale up all our productions. Right? We'll, we'll require a lot of content from a lot of markets across Africa. Uh, currently, we're doing about 6,500 hours annually, and in the next three years, we're, we're looking to double that. So there is a lot of runway, there's still huge opportunity, and we want to be in front and center uh, of that opportunity. And, and tell us a little bit more about the Comcast deal. Um, in terms of technology, what does that provide for multi choice? I mean, the, the Comcast deal in terms of technology, there's a lot of open space, right? Comcast coming from their world and merging with our world because we already had a platform and we, we had a way of working that is going to improve and merge our ways of thinking together and come up with a better product that gives the, uh, the end user a better user experience. So holistically, we're excited about everything that the scale protects for us. Like I said earlier, a lot of content is going to be required to fulfill this deal, but then there's a lot of efficiency that are going to come about uh, with us partnering with the Comcast uh, and looking at the technology side of things. Yeah, because it's, it's interesting. It used to be the, the idea that we were going to have these huge global streamers that would take all rights, all territories in perpetuity, um, and then multi-choice, for example, might lose access to a lot of the studio content. Uh, certainly, I 
subscribe to Showmax and Harkin because it's an HBO content. Um, it doesn't feel like HBO is arriving anytime soon. So, so really, multi-choice is in a much more interesting position as a kind of local champion that's bringing in global support to, to kind of raise the game. Um, and, and Showmax, I've heard, is going to be quadrupling its content. Yes, and, 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 and Showmax is the one player that's predominantly doing local content, right? So what this pretend for the local film and TV industries across Africa, it's, it's amazing. I think, I think the industry should just be as excited as we are for, for the opportunity we have. Okay. Can you give us a little hint of the kinds of things you might be looking for um, as, as content, or is it kind of a, a really such a broad category of, of things you're looking at? I mean, it's, it's, it's broad, it's extremely broad. And I think with the advent of the internet and streaming, then um, the viewer has got a whole wide breadth of content that they, they see right globally, which they would like to see locally as well. And that's why, if you look at the content trend now, right, uh, we're moving a lot into you know, celebrity reality space, you know, the real housewives and those kinds of things, then it's open season. Just come with a, come with a proposal that makes sense, something that's, that, that's, that's very authentic, but also something that takes into account the global trends. And I'm happy to have the discussion. And um, I'm, I'm kind of interested to know, you know, where, where do we think South African and African stories are going? Um, what do you think is, Leila, you and Khalid as well, what do you think is succeeding in capturing audiences' imagination across the continent? And, and what kind of stories should we be telling, aren't we telling, or should we be telling more of? Sorry, I'm going to put you on. Do you want to start while I try and get um, there? Sorry, so the question again is African stories, what stories should we be telling, what opportunities might we be missing, mm -hmm. the kind of stories out there? I think, well, if, I'm, if, I'm, if you want me to be honest, I think we are missing on a lot of stories. And I don't think it's what stories should we be telling, it's what stories do we want to tell. And the idea of streamers is that they should be allowing us to open up those stories, as opposed to you know pigeonholing us into this is what an African story is. I'm going to start with the African conversation, which is there is no African content, right? and then the branding of African content. I think start um, and so on. Um, so I think um, I think what we need to start doing is. Empowering voices and not just technicians within the South African landscape of storytellers. Because right now there's a lot of focus on commission, pitch work that is like young adult, this and that. But there isn't enough development of voices in the country. There's a lot of te technical development, a lot of technicians being developed, but not enough voices being developed. And all of this has to do with if there's a platform being provided, we shouldn't be dictated to as to what kind of stories we tell. So I think. The question isn't what kind of stories should we, it's what kind of stories do we want to tell and how can then we work with streamers and broadcasters to, to create a, a wider scope of I mean, I think you make a very important point where you say, you know, Africa isn't a country. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's an incredibly large, diverse continent. Um, and, but at the same time, it's not a huge market relative to, you know, a rich, um, countries elsewhere and so there's a sense in which we're trying to, to kind of bring that audience together to, to make the budgets bigger to make that mission more um, exciting and you know how how are we finding content traveling within Africa from your perspective Timothy um, do Nigerians enjoy South African real housewives um, do, do uh, South Africans enjoy um, Nigerian content Nollywood stuff like how how excited are we about our continent's content? That we are across Africa very excited for each other's content, right? That's what you say. South Africans are watching Nigeria and vice versa. But look at Shaka Ilembe, for example. Right? We, when, when, when the business launched Shaka Ilembe, we had it in Kenya, in Zambia, in Uganda, 
in the original language, in English subtitles. And it's literally keeping the light up. People have been reading that, uh, the conversation, right? So that, that goes to show, show you that the borders are open uh, to your good show, uh, good story to tell. People will, will watch that show. And I think Shaq al is such a good uh, example of our ambitions being kind of much more, um, much bigger uh, than they were in the past. Uh, and, and I think multi-choice has taken some gambles on things, you know, really spend money, you know, like get, get something that's world class. We just saw the trailer for Spinners. Uh, Spinners was a, was a bigger budget production and was nominated first. African series to be nominated as Series Mania for Best Drama. So it doesn't feel like we're doing old little shows, you know, that are that they are high global, they are authentic, but they also have ambition and scale and and potential reach internationally. Right? Right. I mean, what do you think about where we've come from, right? Where we've come from Easy Buyer, for example, a couple of years ago with Tinsel in Nigeria to now Shaka and the Real Housewives of Lagos and, and Big Brother Nigeria, it's constant improvement. And, and as a business, as a broadcaster, we, you need to be able to to walk that line, right? Um, I mean, the creative, and just to call it point, right? Uh, you need to have the creative uh, uh, cut blanche to do what you want as a creative, but the broadcaster also needs to be able to cater to the customer and what the customer needs. And, and so we, we walk that fine line, right? Um, at the market choice, we get content through the three we commission content that they produce that are put out, and that, that's called solicited. Uh, solicited. And then there's the unsolicited content where the producer, they can't, for example, can come to the show, and suddenly ask for anything specific. Yeah. Not saying this is the edge group, this is the genre, but, but all of these passion projects can be moved to us. And if we are aligned in the direction, we go ahead and produce that. So there's different ways of having and and jumping to you, Louise, um, so it's interesting to hear Shaka wasn't in fact adapted into other African languages. Um, but from your experience, how much um, does dubbing help kind of create new audiences within the continent um, for, for South African content, for example? Hugely. I mean, I think we've seen that a lot. Um, whether it's, you know, we speak so many languages that we create content multilingually, like that's how we tell our stories. So certainly we're seeing South African stories which are being dubbed into other African local languages, um, into French, so that they can then travel within the continent. And then conversely, South African and other African content that we, that we see within our studios is then being dubbed into English to then transport off the continent. And I think that that that's the part that really excites me, um, is to be able to see that. Because our stories are amazing. Um, whether you're watching something from Nigeria that's in Pigeon and you know, Yoruba, um, which we then bring in here. And I think that it's about the storytelling, that's what's important. It's just how you localize it so that it's authentic, so that the audience on the other side will embrace it and, and make it their own. And yeah, talking about South African content or African content traveling internationally, do you have any specific examples in mind? Or just... <laughs> That's a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it wasn't meant to be, I guess. I mean, no, so... no, no, but it's one of my favorite titles at the moment. I mean, think, I think Pina Banama was a great example of that. Um, and it, it's, I think the audiences agree. So it's about being able to take something that is specifically ours um, and enable other people to enjoy it. Okay, yes, sorry. I, it wasn't a, an attempt at self-promotion in other numbers of the show. I was a producer. So I, uh, but uh, there is, I feel, and, and Leila, maybe you can tell me, do you think people are more interested in South African and African content outside um, Africa? Um, yeah, I think that. I think we're in a very transitional period at the moment. I feel like the, the target now is at the African market. So for the first time, we are making content for our own uh, supposed market, but as uh, Khalid said, we have lost that space of being able to, to develop and cultivate some singular visionary voices, which I feel um, does create a career. We have a, we have definitely have a few established, but if I look at the landscape for new entrants into the industry, 
with the kind of reduction in state support or unreliability in it and, and an inability to be able to finance your, your film or your work without a very strong um, influence of the streamers or the, the broadcasters. Um, yeah, I, I look at that space and I go, for example, last year, I think it was the first year we didn't submit to the Oscars as South Africa. So while we have this massive boom in, in production, with a lot of opportunities available, there also seems to be a very clear um, drop or decline in, in expressive content that showcases a, a voice of a director. Um, and, I, and I think, as I said, it's a transitional period, so I do think that these two will eventually align. There will be kind of a, a, a movement of trying to make independent cinema, but I think that movement is really, really important as well. So, <laughs> I didn't say that. Yeah. <laughs> I, thought you, I, thought you went I thought you were in team. I thought you were in team. Video, was that your question? Yeah, yeah, I think the, you know, that indie cinema space is not um, as kind of prominent as it was. I feel like the commercial space, TV series, you know, when you have multiple directors and you have larger investments and therefore potentially more strings, more risk, avoidance sometimes. Um, but I think, you know, I think Spinners, I think Shaggy Lembe, you know, show that there is, um, that Sounds was also a kind of a real um, opportunity to do something different. And I think, you know, it's working within the system yeah. and finding ways to, to make something that, you know, you can justify the budgets and the resources to be able to do something special or you do something, you know, on a smaller budget. Um, but let's go into government support a little bit more. I mean, we just had the guidelines, the DTIC guidelines um, released last week. Um, sound one, two, yes, thank you. Um, what, what came out of that um, presentation for you? You know, as a general sense. As a general sense? Did we get that? <laughs> um, as a general sense, I think it's important to also preface this discussion with the fact that if we look at the continent as a whole, the the resources that we do have in South Africa are, are quite unique in that we actually do have these opportunities. Um, but at the same time, the lack of functionality of the rebate has for a long time, I think, set a lot of people back um, and caused a lot of pain and frustration and, and, um, and heartache, I think, for the partners as well. But um, the new guidelines that were launched, I think there was an overwhelming sense of just kind of um, acknowledging or accepting that this cannot be our solution anymore and that we need to finally let go and, and use utilize it as something that is a bonus, that's something that could be recoupment, something that could so come to the, the rebate rebates. specifically. Um, but I think we're, that's in terms of local uh, producers and we do need to, to come together and, and try and figure out how we bridge that gap so that we can still you know, participate in the ownership of our own IP because that's effectively what that was there for. Um, but at the same time, I think it affects the international um, you know, servicing industry a lot more, uh, these new guidelines, um, capping the, the, the amount of 25 million, which would mean you're trying to attract foreigners to shoot here for 1.3 million US dollars. And that's a huge um, aspect of our sector, you know, is the international service work. So, um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a transitional period, as I said. I think we need to put our heads together and start to think of other ways to, to create our own content, other ways of seeking resource, um, to ensure that we always maintain that balance between, you know, commission work and 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 work that we own. Because the rebate is really only accessible to non-commissioned work. Yeah. Um, it means that the producer has got to have some kind of back end yeah. and some control over the project. Um, and you know, if, that, if that's kind of withering away, then producers are going to be back to kind of just servicing productions for broadcasters. Um, so I think, yeah, I think the um, the fact that you know there is um, a new guideline out there um, will hopefully provoke some real soul searching.
I feel like I'm at the airport. Are we going to miss our flight, guys? Should, should you go? Um, so, yes. Only if you want to. Only if you want to. Don't. It's the voice of God telling you you have to move. Um, so, yeah. So, I want to move on to, to kind of where um, content is living, right? Um, in, in Africa and South Africa as, as part of it, but to slightly a lesser extent. Um, I heard the statistic that one of the um, streamers, 80% of people are viewing on their cell phones. That is how they're you, you know, engaging with content. What do you think that does in terms of how you think about content, design, shooting, production, creation, when that is probably where your content is going to land up and, and finally be um, watched? Khalid, as a, as a creative, Layla. I mean, I have two minds in this. One is a producer and one is a creative. From the producing side, I think it's great because it's a platform that will allow more access to more stories. As a creative, I think it's terrible because I think um, quality is going to drop immediately because what's going to happen is scrolling through your phone trying to find something to watch and not, fi- you know, not finding it interesting within the first eight seconds or whatever that, that time frame is and then moving on to story uh, and hoping to find something there and then moving on from it to a new story hoping to find something that isn't really terrible and I think the lack of balance is the issue in our industry as well I think the lack of independent cinemas for ex- exhibition for cinematic content I think the lack of engagement with broadcasters with smaller production team series really is the reality and then streamers as well like you were speaking earlier about the, the African brand no, I'm going left and right here but I think it's important to have this conversation is the, the idea of the, the African brand. It's more powerful, I guess, to refer to every South Africa, every African content as African, as, it, as if it's coming out of a country, for a foreign market, right? Because that's what they're looking for. They're looking for African, whether it's Ghanaian, whether it's Nigerian, whether it's South African, it doesn't matter. But what we're doing is we're, we're almost unintentionally we're hitting them on what it means to be South African. And that would be African as a whole, as a brand. And that's going to happen within the story as well, which is... Mm, yeah. Um, so we'll carry on. Please. Okay, lovely. Uh, so I think also the, one, of the, one of the other conversations is the... Really what is that commission work? So you're saying, okay, as a platform, I'm not going to name names, it doesn't matter. It's a common thread, which is we don't accept content outside of this genre, which is what right now the young adult thing is massive. So everything is young adult shows. If you look across all the platforms, it's all young adult. There is no, that means no other person from any other genre who's, or any other perspective, any other demographic is being allowed to develop that voice and therefore is not able to actually to grow. And like uh, Lelo was saying, the issue becomes we have kind of like one one dimensional African stories. And that is not always who we are. You know, and that's kind of the big issue. And so what happens is if you get turned away because you don't have a story that fits with what should be perceived as African on an international platform, that is the issue that, that we're facing. So I know I can went all around in a circle, but it's in one way and it's not good in another way. In that we do need to balance it out, just like variation in terms of genre, in terms of types of stories, in terms of format, I think it's gonna be great for format. I think people being able to do like eight minute, you know, TV series and like do 10 episodes of those as, as like as opposed to, you know, the 30 or 24 minute or whatever the case may be. I think that's gonna be great for that. But in terms of quality, and I think right now, and I'm on a mission, you know, and maybe like self delusional at this point, but I'm on a mission to promote specializing. I think there's too many people trying to do too many things. We need specialists in this industry. We need specialist writers. We need specialist directors. We need people who focus on one thing and not like, I'll hire you to do this thing. That's the only way I can get paid and I understand that like, it's an industry that's collapsing on top of each other. But what you need to take into consideration on the final one of that is the reason I think we should promote specializing. I think every single one of you 
need to go out and need to specialize in something because the local industry, the foundation of it is not going to support for much longer. And at some point, you're going to have to engage with the international market. And I don't see many South African filmmakers being able to engage with it, the international standards of storytelling. That's my opinion. Um, and I know probably didn't answer your question at all. <laughs> <laughs> lots, of, lots, of, lots of great questions. That's absolutely fine. Sorry. Um, I think I want to start opening up to questions so we have a real kind of conversation. Um, do we have some roving mics? Yep. Over there. Sorry. Please, uh, when you ask a question, just introduce yourself um, briefly and ask the question with a question mark at the end. That's generally how we know it's a question. And then this gentleman. Hi, good morning, everybody. I'm Rilia Mamocha from Black Swan Media. Sorry, I'm back. Do you? Rilia Mamocha from Black Swan Media. Thanks. Um, my question is around what the comment you made around specializing. I think that really makes sense in the US where the market is massive, but how do we specialize? You know, for us as Black Swan Media, we specialize in live entertainment, but the economy is so bad budgets are so low yeah. that we really have to open ourselves up to everything. Much as we'd love to be um, specialists, there aren't that many shiny floor budgets going around. Yeah. So, how do we solve that solution without, you know, directly trying to solve Cyril's rand? Okay. Um... Sorry, and also to add to that, yeah. we're in stage five load shedding. The moment yeah. all the BRIC summit attendees got home and said home safe, we're on stage five now. <laughs> I love the subtext of the, of the question. Uh, okay, so it's two things. One, you're gonna, it might be like an actual solution that you can use. That's independence immediately. I have not, and that's why when you mentioned the DTI and all that stuff, I don't know anything about that. I've been in the industry for 13 years. Most people probably like know me if you're here, like whatever, I've emailed, you know, a couple of times. But other than that, I don't approach NFVF, I don't approach Netflix, I don't approach DTF, nothing. I don't do any sort of uh, organizational funding because I don't think those organizations are trying to develop. And I'm sorry to like be crass or whatever, but I don't think they, they're there to develop. I think they're there to help established filmmakers, which is not us. It's not people like us. So I think independence is the way to go. I think if you, if you build a real, and, I, and I'll tell you something right now. I made a film in 2018. That was the first feature film that I made. It was like 80,000 Rand. I'm still earning money off it. I own the film outright. Nobody else owns that film with me. I'm still making money off that film. It's a lot more thing. So that's the first thing. Independence is the way. Like independence is the way to go. And if you can raise, because right now the technology and the things that are happening, a lot of platforms are going to get, like you need to use this camera and you need to use that camera. And then you watch international shows and they're using like they're using like GoPros and their shows and you're like, what since when? I thought we had to use like a RE Mini or whatever. So get out of the mindset, independence. And the second thing you're not gonna like is there has to be a point where you have to set the ships on fire. That's the reality. Is you're not gonna get to a point where like now things are gonna change without there being any sort of problem. And the problem is coming, I guarantee you the problem's coming. We do not create enough content of quality to compete on a global standard. The local, we run on a local financing, right, which I call it mandate filmmaking, which is that governments send out money, that company has to spend the money with other companies. Nobody actually has to qualify, so that means you don't have to make your money back in order to make another film. You don't have to qualify, where does that money go? How is it being spent? What is the quality of the production? Therefore, the, the quality of storytelling is not good. And once locally it collapses on top of itself, which is going to, I mean, it's, it's like every industry has issues. As local filmmakers, we're all going to be stuck thinking that the way to do it is to go through the, the, the NFVF mandated checklist of filmmaking, which is not going to work. When you're dealing with an independent, you have to specialize. So what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is you need to gather yourself and you need to realize that like you're specializing now, it's going to be hard, but in the long run, it's going to pay off because you need to be able to have something that no one else can do but you. And even if someone else can do it, they can only do it with you, like you. I mean, like you, with you, if that makes sense. Okay, sorry, I've got to answer the question. And I, I talk for a long time. Yeah. I'm passionate about this, so stop me at some point. Um, yeah, I mean, I just, I think um, a kind of a diverse skill set of, of how you put things together. You know, some projects might be 
with the NFEA. Some projects might be a Netflix commission, some projects might be um, kind of private equity and big borrow and steal. Like, I think it's good to have a diversity of models that you're working with um, so that, you know, it used to be that a lot of companies were completely dependent on the SABC, and when that collapsed the first time, um, they, you know, everyone went bankrupt <coughs> because everyone was dependent on the SABC. So the more kind of flexibility and, and ingenuity you've got, the better, I think. Um, I think in defense of South African content, I think it's doing very well internationally. Um, there's been a, a few breakout successes, and I think we are telling stories at the global level um, for the first time, partly because we have the resources to make shows um, where we're not shooting 20 pages a day. Um, it becomes very difficult for them to, to have something that's really, you know, gorgeous looking. Um, and But at the same time, I don't think everything has to be like that, you know. You're talking about these short series. You know, if people are watching on their phones and they have their TikTok brain and they're kind of like, I'm not interested in three seconds, then I'm on to the next thing. We've got to be, it doesn't have to be sh shot on an area. It doesn't have to be huge budget. So there's a whole range of, of possibilities. And I'm genuinely more optimistic, I think, than, than Kali. I'm, I'm very, sorry, I'm very optimistic. I'm not, I'm not optimistic about the future. I think there's a lot to be done and there's a lot that we can look forward to. I'm saying to you that it shouldn't be, um, uh, what's the word I'm going to give you? It shouldn't be the exception that things are going well for filmmakers in South Africa. It should be the rule. It should be there. It should be like a standard where people are making a living. It shouldn't be that you are struggling to get in or you're at the top of the industry where you're getting all the funding and that gap in the middle is empty. It shouldn't be like that. And that's what I mean. I'm not saying that, like, at the top, I would love to at some point make a, a show where I don't have to, you know, stress about money, but, or a film, preferably a film. You guys make your shows about films, right? But I'm saying that the idea is that it shouldn't be such a, a, a such a massive gap between trying to get in and, all, and like, having everything you need to make films. There should be a middle ground where you can survive and develop as a filmmaker. That you can, you can essentially, on the day today, wake up and go, you know, today it's going to be a hard day, but there's a, the, at the end of the at the end of the tunnel there's a light, as opposed to right now, which is there's a bunch of people struggling and there's a few people getting more funding and everybody else is dying. And I'm not saying everybody should get high in funding. I think you should qualify to get that level of funding. Sorry, I'm putting my hand in front of your face. I think you should qualify to get that level of funding. But in order to qualify, you need to work. And how how can you work if you can't make anything? You understand what I'm saying? That's that's my that's my. Point. Sorry, I think Leila wants to say something. Yeah, yeah. Am I my yes. I was just going to add to that. I think there is a huge, um, a huge gap between who is actively and sustainably working right now, and who isn't. So while I agree that uh, our content, you know, it's gone, it's it's increased in visibility, in resources, but it's still reserved for a select few. And it's interesting because you know we talk about spinners. You mentioned blood songs. Those are that's Jacobo, that's Jamil. Those are indie filmmakers who came from a space where they had to fight to showcase their voice and then to be given that opportunity. So I think what's, what's also important to note is that that gap of, of cultivating those voices, um, it's struggling at the moment, you know? And those are the future directors of Swiss, you know, or, or of Reka, or the, the big, the big um, successful shows. So yeah, that for me is a, is a crisis. Oh. I think this gentleman had a question. Essentially, where, the, where we can bridge that gap is through globalizing the content. Because if those stories are able to extend into other territories and other languages, that's what's going to enable the model to be sustainable. Because it's taking it out of this current market and moving it on. Thank you. Great question. Thank you. Sorry, we can't hear you. Oh, is that better? Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Dimitri Martinez, uh, MCM Digital. I have two questions, if I may. They're both short. Uh, yes, there, was a comment up, made, there was a comment made about the low internet penetration uh, at the beginning. Um, does that also mean that there's um, a scope for uh, over the air television, whether it's DTT or DTH, um, given the low-ish numbers of um, internet penetration. Um, so just maybe your thoughts on that rather than just the streaming environment and 
And then uh, the second question, I mean, this whole thing, what is African content, etc. Is it content that comes from an, an African filmmaker from an African country, or is it about uh, new voices, new formats, and, and novel, not novel ideas? Thanks. So, if, if I look at the rest of Africa, you know, Kenya, Kenya has a pretty, pretty big internet penetration. But we find in those markets, um, uh, the audiences aren't really looking to choose between streaming and, 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 and the pay TV, right? A lot of households have both. And it's also helped by the fact that there's smart TVs now which have apps. And so you have your DTH or DTT subscription in addition to your uh, showbox on the, on the TV app. So in, in many countries across Africa, we're still, we're still living side by side uh, with each other. Uh, I think also another factor would be there's just one TV in the household, and you have these teams who want to watch shows. And so they will obviously use mobile or the tablets to, to engage with content. This just offers a variety for, for, for the consumer, but for broadcasters like MultiChoice, then it gives us the opportunity to be more innovative, right? Um, we have products like DSTV Streamer or DSTV Stream, which is DSTV Now, just so that we can be able to bring this whole uh, pay TV experience onto, onto the apps and onto the streaming uh, platform. And we have our stand there in case anybody needs any more information on that. Please, please, please. And can I just add, I mean, in the US or Europe, you're seeing um, a, a kind of cannibalization of cable, you know, uh, pay TV by streamers, uh, which has caused a lot of problems. But is that the case here? Is streaming eating into pay TV in the same way? Not, not really. Not really. And I'll tell you why. Because, and to Khalid's point, right, with, with the advent of streaming here, then you will see the content that you see on Showmax. Media traditionally had your 26 parts, 13 parts, 52. On, on streaming now, we bring eight episodes, six episodes of series, right? And so the, the OTT platform is finding new ways of, of showing content where people are not, don't want to be tied to come to a specific time or specific durations. So there's no real cannibalization yet. Everybody is finding their own space. Now, the challenge that this pretends then is for the pay TV platforms, which are obviously more expensive than streaming, then you find some customers opting to focus on streaming. Um, but, but as multi choice, we have solutions where we have very different, we have different paths and we meet you at the point where you can afford it. So we have DTH and DTT offerings in various markets, and that's why in the rest of Africa you find that people are able to have both you know, your streamer and your pay TV uh, together because it's affordable. And, and then just one final thing on DTT. I mean, here in South Africa, I think it's been a real disaster um, because a lot of people don't have smart TVs, they don't have the set-top boxes, but uh, DTT signal, um, you know, the, the dual illumination is not um, the case anymore. And I think SABC, we, we're kind of seeing it in bankruptcy again, essentially. Um, and part of that is because they've lost audiences, because they can't access it on the, you know, on the, uh, the analog signal. And Uzala, which is the biggest show, has lost 60% of its audience. Uh, and that's also load shedding and a whole lot of other things. But that DTT is, is not a purely positive uh, development here because we weren't ready for it inexplicably after how long, I don't know. Um, 20 years, I think. Um, so the second question to just what does African content mean? Is it uh, everything? Yeah. And I think that that's also another limiting thing that we're doing is we're trying to box. This is the best South African movie to ever come out. This is the most authentic list to come out. We can't do that. We need to create an industry which means it needs to thrive, which means there needs to be room and space for you to make any kind of content that you want to make. If you are a superstar to TikTok, TikTok films, doesn't make you any less of a filmmaker than if you're making a big budget TV series. So I think the more that we allow everyone to go in the direction that they want to go in and support various different kinds of expressions, um, then we'll really start to see true, true development within this, what constitutes African content.
I actually think, sorry, I don't think it's the lead's point. There is a perception of African content to be a certain thing. And and I think that's something we have to kind of problematize. Because I thought that's what your question was saying, is what is it, like, what does it, what, is, what does, what, how do you qualify African content? And I think that's where you have to fix the issue by, by um, what is it? What is it? <laughs> it's uh, localizing the area. So if you are South African making some, a South African project and then you claim that it's a South African project, it is very difficult for someone to stand up and say that's not a South African project. But if you are a South African making an African project and then all of a sudden you have to qualify now, you have, how, do, how is it an African project? What makes African content? And that's an issue. It's a big issue. You have to localize it. And yes, as Africa, we all have a thread that runs through through Africa, but we are all not on the same page, and we are all telling different stories from different sides, as we should, because everybody else gets to. So that then it eliminates the need for that question, which is, I am a South African, I'm making South African stories. The end of the conversation. I don't need to qualify for myself. I think we've got one quick, okay, two quick questions. <coughs> uh, over there. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Razid Dunn, Dragon Productions. My question is to Louise. Uh, Louise, you mentioned you know one of the ways to, to get it to a, to get the product or the film to a to a universal audience is through dubbing. So if you take it one step further and you go to the filmmakers and you know we're creating the content at platforms like these, what would you suggest to the filmmakers? In a, aside from before you go to dubbing, what would you want to make? Um, what you should what should you include in your films? To give you that universal appeal, is it casting or like what would you suggest to help with the dubbing? I'm not sure whether I think the story has to be unique and it's, it has to be the story that that you're trying to create. Um, I think that what it looks like culturally or from a casting perspective is less important. Um, I, I think the critical thing that we see time and again in our business is. Cont filmmakers in, in, on the continent don't understand the value of their assets. And I think, you know, you spoke to the fact that you're still making money with that project four years later. The only way that that's possible is that if you're going to create a solid set of assets, that's going to be able to, that's going to enable you to extend, um, extend your story so that you're going to be able to be created in, in, in additional languages. So I think that. It's important that the story remains authentic to what, what the storyteller wants to, to, to communicate. Um, it's really just those technical assets that are key to being able to, to, to globalize your content. Yeah. And, and, and just to add, it's not just dubbing assets, it's publicity. Absolutely, it's um, the whole package. Kind of, kind of the, the different tracks yes. that you've got to have so you don't you know, burn in your subtitles and all that kind of stuff. You've got to think at the beginning. Um, so. And that's and that'll be our last question. Thank you. Uh, yeah, last last one. Uh, I'll try and keep it short. Like Charlie, I can speak a lot. Uh, my name is Mabel Bauer. I'm with the company called Rosia Bauer Productions. It's my wife. I work for her. Um, so we made a movie uh, a couple of years ago uh, called Bias Cafe, which is um, released theatrically. We uh, opened at the worst time possible because we uh, we opened just before lockdown. Now uh, we opened uh, on the day we opened, load shedding started. Um, so uh, yeah, we, we had a double bang. But like Charlie, we own our sorry, we own our form. I just hit my wife in the head, so I apologize. Um, we um, we own our form, so we, uh, we we make money off our form. We didn't make any money in the box office because we take there. But I mean, we, we just had an offer from Canal Plus. We want to dub the form into French. So, uh, like, I've got a question in here. But the point for me is to to Razine and to everybody else. For me, it all starts with content. Your story it starts with your story. You've got to have a story. And for us, when we approach stories, it's got to be a story that's universal, that people all around the world we feel can relate to. Um, and in case of point, can help us along with other friends. So obviously, there's something in that story. But my question is about the content that we're telling, want to tell, people want to tell an African story. What is an African story? What's the Indian story? What is an American, what do Americans do? Do they tell American stories? Or do they just tell good stories or stories that will appeal to as wide an audience as possible? Isn't that, shouldn't that be our starting point? Just to tell a story that we feel has legs, that people want to watch it and embrace it universally. 
not necessarily say, I need to come up with an African story or, you know, so that's my question. Sorry. I would say yes, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. But that's why I said, I said, uh, you know, the you make your story as a South African filmmaker, you make a, a story. And if you if, they, if you happen to brand in South African, you can qualify. But otherwise, you just go out and you make a story. But the idea of like African content, I think we need to start like moving away from that as like a as like a branding exercise because I think it's really good. Yeah. Just to reiterate, uh, how you say it, right? For me, I think the term an Af- African story is a story made in Africa by Africans. That's it. The story can be universal. Look at Wakanda or, or Invictus, right? African story, but not made in Africa. Africa. And we never qualified them as Africans. We know where they came from. We, we, we align with the storyline, but we know they're not. But if you're shooting a story in South Africa with South Africans, the storyline can be universal, the themes can be universal, the technical quality is what's going to appeal to everybody else, but keep it authentic. Because ultimately, you need everybody in this continent or in this country to buy into your story before you take it out there. If they don't buy it, then it's not going to go anywhere else. I think that's also an important point. Just finally, when you're developing something, that you create something that's, you've got a strong base here, a local broadcaster or some kind of um, springboard, and then to bring in the more international stuff. So thanks so much, everyone. I wish you a safe flight, and uh, thank you for joining us and see you around the market. Thanks to our panel.